My, uh, my name is uh, Norman Carollo. I'm a uh, furniture maker designer uh, based in Ottawa, Ontario. Uh, my, my background is about 30, I think 30 years in, uh, in woodworking, maybe 35 years. So I began by studying cabinet making and uh, I became a box maker. When I say that, I mean, uh, I was, uh, where we began with small music boxes. And if you go to my website, woodskills.com, you'll see the uh, progression of some of my work along with my uh, YouTube channel, Wood Skills Courses. There's a, there's a few videos that show the progression of my work over the years. So I began with uh, box making and I progressed from small music boxes to uh, jewelry boxes. And then I, the jewelry boxes became more and more complex as I uh, the jewelry box business was very competitive at the time, 1990s. So I, uh, I really ramped up my uh, my skills and my techniques and the, the type of uh, jewelry box I was creating. So I began with the, the most simple jewelry box. And at the end, it was a three, three level with a drawer and uh, compartments that slid and everything. You can move them across. And uh, I even had a brass plaque included so you could... Uh, so that was uh, that was interesting, but I began to tire of that because it became more of a production environment for me. And uh, so early in the 2000s, I realized I should uh, my 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 real passion was to create furniture, design and create furniture. So I I looked into a uh, a local school, the Rosewood Studio, actually in Almont, Ontario, and I uh, I started uh, enrolling in some of their court classes over a period of three to four years. I took quite a few classes there with some visiting instructors, mostly like uh, some names I'll throw out there, are Gary Hack and all that. The, uh, the premise of the school was uh, work with hand tools exclusively with some machine work early in the processing. So this is when I transitioned from mostly machines to hand tools in those years. And I really began to appreciate uh, working with hand tools more and more, and I gravitated to hand tools, and I'm full on hand tools now today. Although I do have a considerable amount of machines here that are from that era also that I use to create my uh, my furniture. And that's that's my background, and, uh, and so I've been designing and creating furniture over the years, and it's mostly considered studio furniture, sort of one-off pieces, and I marketed them, and Today, I don't market them as much. I just make them, and uh, if, uh, if there's a demand for that particular piece, I'll sell it. And if uh, and I usually try to make two of everything, uh, slightly different from each other, so I have one to work with. Although I do design on paper and sketch, and I, and I demonstrate that in my furniture design classes and my design courses, I, I still like to work with an existing piece and get the dimensions from it if it's a successful uh, design or it's in style. Along with that, so I'm not, I'm not exclusively hand tools. I, you know, I should clear that up. I should, uh, I combine hand tools with some machinery, and the machinery is typically used early on in the uh, processing some wood. So I tend to buy raw, raw wood. And although I can hand plane and dress wood on a workbench and small, small pieces, but if it's for a larger furniture piece, it makes much more sense to just run it through a joiner and a planer, and then it's uh, in a bandsaw. So I use a band saw considerably in my work and uh, sometimes a table saw, but this is early on. So once I've, once I've established the design and I have the, uh, the parts uh, assembled, I mean, the parts laid out, I can, I can begin working on the joinery. And this is, this is my favorite part, working on the joinery. And most of the joinery is performed by hand. And uh, then it's the assembly and uh, fitting. And there's knife hinges I use. I, I mortise in the knife hinges by hand and uh, all the detail work by hand and that's that's the part i enjoy the most and the finishing so once once i begin to see a piece of furniture that's come to life and then become more and more interested when it's early on when it's just components and when it's at the design stage it's not quite as exciting so i so i um, the term that most people use for that type of woodworking where you combine machines and uh, hand tools is well-known term is hybrid woodworking. It's widely used in the, wood, in, the, in the woodworking world. So I would have to say that I'm a hybrid woodworker, but I lean towards hand tools more. And you can see all the hand tools I have, and I have other hand tools. This is just one part of my workshop. So it's a two-level workshop, and I have other workbenches and other larger veneering setups in the lower part, and another similar workbench to this. 
at the other end, along with some sort of smaller machines around the periphery, but everything gravitates towards hand tools. And if you want to see some of my work, again, it's at the woodskills.com site. Another thing, just summarize, summarize a little bit about my background. I've also written a few books that I, they're available in digital format or hard copy through my uh, Woodskills site. So you can get, uh, this is how to start a business, a woodworking business, a wood artist when I delved into a sculpture, more art, uh, art type uh, pieces. This is all about my journey from my former career, which was night tech. It was a 30 year career, actually, 30, 35 year career. So I, I slowly migrated part-time and then full-time into uh, furniture making and woodworking. So this uh, this describes the whole journey, all the ups and downs I had, and uh, it's quite interesting, actually. I've had good reviews on that. This is uh, another book of mine. It's a book on uh, the design process and the making process of, uh, of how I develop furniture designs and all the techniques I use, and, uh, and it's... Uh, Quite the photography is pretty good and everything, and uh, it lays out all the all the uh, the uh, steps I I, uh, I follow in my own furniture making on the design stage right through to the uh, creation of the furniture. This is a more recent book, it's uh, less than a year old, and it's about quiet woodworking and it's all about hand tools and now the advantages of uh, hand tool woodworking and and I'll get into that very shortly. So this is another book with some very good photography, and I talk about my philosophy and how how I have embraced uh, using hand tools in my work. So this is an interesting book. Get few good reviews on these books. I won't talk too much more about that. They're available through my woodskills.com site. Back to hand tools, since the topic is hand tools today, I'd like to talk about the advantages of hand tools. Less noise and dust. Now I have a, an issue with dust. I've had an issue with dust early on in my woodworking career. I uh, I had not embraced hand tools at all. And I was mostly jig making and working with machines and much smaller workshop. And dust was uh, was a huge problem. I, just to give you an example, some of my, my production work for jewelry boxes and uh, cigar humidors at the time, I had so much, I would generate so much dust, I would have to sweep the walls at the end of the day. I'm not even kidding. I worked with uh, tropical woods a lot. So depending on the flavor of the day, like for example, paduk, the walls were orange, and I actually literally had to take a broom and sweep the walls. And that's when I began to realize the uh, the dangers of uh, of wood dust, specifically with uh, exotic woods, and how how you could uh, become allergic to these woods over time, and then uh, it just stops your woodworking. I've known a few woodworkers that have had to stop woodworking because of allergies. They're allergic to most woods, so I I think I have an allergy to uh, balsa wood. But I, uh, so I, I had to make a change in my uh, woodworking to eliminate dust, and that's when I, I went to the other direction. I, I still use machines, but I, uh, I went uh, uh, full on with uh, dust collection. So I have a, an, um, quite an impressive dust collection system here for all the machines. I have two uh, full two horsepower dust collectors that I uh, hooked onto every machine when I do use the machines. Not as much anymore, and I have uh, silly mounted air filters, two of them, and I have a whole shop dust filter. And I won't show that today because I have very limited time. So we're, and we're talking about hand tools, but so the dust situation was totally under control over the years for me, uh, but I've transitioned to hand tools. So that's, that's another improvement. So I hardly generate any dust anymore anyway, but I just want to let you know that hand tools, using hand tools, and if you decide to go into that direction, you can eliminate the whole issue of uh, dust and, of course, noise. Noise is another issue. I don't have a, an issue, a problem with my current shop. It's out in the country setting just outside Ottawa for noise. And it's quite a, insulated and designed to contain noise. But I don't generate as much noise anyway. But if you're, uh, if you're in a condo environment or a, a basement, noise is much more of an issue. My first shop was in a basement and I had to actually insulate the ceiling the, uh, between the joists because of the transmission of noise from, uh, from the basement through the, uh, through the joists into the upper floor. So that's if you have a family with children and, or if you're sharing a, a dwelling with somebody else, that could be an issue. So that's another advantage of uh, using hand tools. Actually, it's a huge advantage and uh, because more and more people are uh, moving into condo environments now and maybe in the future I will too, I'm not sure, but you know, at that point, I, I would um, 
I'm, I'm very glad that I, I will have embraced hand tools because I could have a small little room in a condo and then perform some hand tool woodworking with a small bench. So that would be nice. And then, uh, of course, maintenance. Machines involve maintenance, uh, table saws, lubrication, cleaning, jointers, planers, you know, replacing, replacing blades, sharpening blades, having uh, spare blades around, nicks, due to nicks and sort of that sort of thing. And all the associated maintenance around revolving around machines is far less maintenance involved in uh, with hand tools aside from uh, sharpening and i can see occasional sharpening sharpening is quite important with hand tools and that's something to consider too if you want to spend more time woodworking and not maintaining machines hand tools is the way to go now again when i talk about uh, hand tools if you're uh, if you're uh, woodworking is if you decided to get into production woodworking full-on production woodworking you're more likely to want to use machines, not just conventional machines like table saw, joiners, planers. You probably want to delve into maybe CNC and uh, even shape or origin uh, because it's more advantageous if you're creating uh, multiple small pieces, the similar pieces, to go that route if you're in production and, uh, and if you want a profit-oriented business. But in my case, I've actually done through that stage and i much prefer doing one-off pieces and uh spending more time per piece and much more, more of a high-end type furniture and i am I'm much more content doing that but if you're uh if your focus is again it's full-on production of small components or small wood objects you can sell at a craft fair for example or a wood art show then yes, you uh, you know I I don't have any qualms against machinery for that. Depends on the type of woodworking you plan on doing. So hopefully the the audience here today is uh, is more of a hand tool oriented or more interested in the, in the path I followed in, uh, in hand tools. So another another advantage of uh, hand tools, uh, as I'm trying to rapidly go through this, so I can actually show you some hand tools. Is the development of hand to eye coordination to become more adept at uh, at uh, understanding the, the sensitivity or the, the the closeness you get associated with, with when you're working with wood directly and not running it through a machine. So you, you begin to uh, understand grain selection, uh, wood selection, and how to work with uh, grain orientation on a piece of wood if you're hand planing, because it becomes super important in the direction you're hand planing as opposed to just running a piece through a machine. So you're, the, the closeness, <laughs> the affinity to so the actual wood is uh, becomes more pronounced uh, when you're using hand tools. Now there is uh, there is and has been a huge revival revolving around hand tools, and for the reasons I just uh, described, hand tools uh, there's there's still a revival occurring. Although CNC has entered the uh, the mix, CNC is all all of a sudden more appealing and more uh, more affordable for the home home uh, shop woodworker. But hand tools is, is up there. I'd say 50% of woodworking today revolves around some form of hand, hand tools. And even as recently as 25, 30 years ago, everything was leaning towards using machines. That's when I, when I began. Hand tools were not popular. And uh, I studied cabinet making at a college over a period of three years. And uh, they, would, they would discuss hand tools, but only uh, in a passing. And then immediately going to um, machines and all that. So that's the revival. Again, using hand tools, uh, you uh, indirectly maintain a woodworking tradition that uh, centuries old, many multiple centuries old tradition. So we're carrying on, we're, we're carrying on and we're maintaining that tradition as opposed to introducing machines. Although machines have been around for over a hundred years and uh, may, they were mainly incorporated into woodworking for, for, uh, for production work but they've uh, filtered down to the, uh, the home woodworker, works in his home, a small hobbyist woodworker. They, they've become more affordable, but as recently as 100 years ago, everything was oriented around hand tools. And, you, and it's a huge uh, market for uh, hand tools of that period, early 1900s, late 1800s. I've got some here that I'll talk about soon. Another uh, advantage of hand tools is that it offsets uh, the increasingly fast-paced technological society we're in. And my, my, my personal background is, uh, is in the IT industry, and I've spent 30 years in the IT industry. I was uh, sort of a Unix heavy in my, in my time, and uh, my whole life revolved around computers. And I, and I, took, uh, I took up woodworking 
embrace my creativity. There's hardly any creativity in the, way we're in the computer industry aside from coding, and which which I did quite quite a bit of. So yeah, I studied uh, computer science and worked in the computer industry and all that, but I became disillusioned with the whole industry, the rapid pace of change, the developments, everything, everything within five years, everything that I, I'd learned was obsolete and I had to re keep relearning and relearning and relearning. And I just, I realized that I need something more, more static in my life, a more static uh, pastime, passion or hobby. And that's when I, I realized that woodworking is fairly static. If you work with hand tools, we, you know, we're, we're doing the same thing people have been doing for 150 to 200 years with hand tools. So that's the beauty of it. You don't have to concern yourself with uh, obsolescence and, uh, and rapid change. Advantages, it offsets a production mindset. So again, going back to that production, if you're intent on production type work, maybe hand tools is not the right thing, but although it's possible, of course, if you're, uh, if you're going the one-off route like myself and making the uh, one-off piece of furniture, then it's great to use hand tools because just the fact that you have to set up a machine and all that, it's, it's so time consuming when it's so easy just to pick up a tool. And just, I want to share this with you that more often, the more often you use hand tools, the, the easier it is to use, to use the tool and you'll, you'll pick it up without even thinking as opposed to like, I, I have a, a beautiful router table that I even sell plants for, but I hardly ever fire it up anymore because I, I will find a way to, to use a hand, a hand plane to create, like for example, a groove in a drawer. Just setting up the router table is so time consuming, the offsets and the bit and change. And, and I can just pick up a plow plane, any of my plow planes here, and create that groove or preset to, uh, for an offset from the bottom of a drawer, uh, drawer side. Just, just give, give you an example. And of course, using hand tools, uh, you save considerably in the workshop space because you don't have machines and machines. I talk about this in my woodworking course with every machine, you need a space around the machine to be able to maneuver and pieces and all that. But with, uh, with a workbench, everything's self, -con everything's contained with a small area. For example, right here, this could be my whole workshop right here, really with an assembly table possibly. So you save considerable on um, workshop space. Again, going back to the uh, apartment or condo settings or, uh, if you're in a small home and using a spare room or something. So actually, let's get into the hand tools. There's categories of hand tools and, uh, and their applications. If you look behind me, this is all a lot of the tools I currently use. These are uh, mortise chisels. These are beveled chisels, and these are measuring and marking tools up here. And this is a marking gauge, for example. So I use two of these marking gauges to, uh, I use them primarily for uh, the setup for dovetail work. So I, I have them preset right now for, for particular types of dovetails I use and all the other uh, instruments to uh, for transferring measurements between boards. This is a depth gauge. I have an example. Uh, this is a depth gauge I designed uh, several years ago. It's my own design, Prolo design. That's one example. This is a centering tool so I can run this on a board and uh, determine the center of the center line. It has a uh, little pin that marks the uh, site. So for a while I was creating some tools and trying to market them. That's another tangent I went off onto it and uh, I sort of enjoyed that. I decided to become a tool maker so I created all these tools that I tried to market and the competition's fierce in the tool making industry so it just wasn't worth to continue but this is a centering gauge that I designed. And I, I would, wood bodied square I designed. Again, this is, uh, I, uh, I researched the whole, the whole process of uh, creating these. And I, so I created this, hoping to, with some brass pins and hoping to market these. But I, again, I went back to furniture making, returned to furniture making. And uh, so this is my, uh, my selection of hand planes that I'll talk about, and uh, and this, uh, this 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 tool cabinet is is recent. I would say in the last year and a half, and before that, I had some flat doors, so I've actually built up the doors to be able to uh, store tools, make them visible, and uh, it's done really well. I'm very happy with the design, so I use this uh, to make everything available. And my recent, most recent addition to this area are these uh, these shelves, and they're quite rigid. So I built up these shelves to store some of my other restored, uh, began to, uh, 
to restore some uh, antique uh, plow planes that I picked up locally for a very, very reasonable price. And they were uh, literally in bad shape. So, so bad that my, uh, <laughs> my, my wife was wondering why I was buying some such junk. But after restoring them and re remaking some of the components like the wedges and sharpening the iron and cleaning the metal, I mean, cleaning it to a point where I don't destroy the patina of the, uh, of the tool. And they work really well. There's a depth adjuster here. So you can see the progression of, uh, of tools. And I use, this, uh, I use this as a plow plane so I can create an offset and create a groove. And this is probably 3 16 iron. These are, you can see the progression and the development of uh, hand planes in that era in the, late, the mid to late 1800s, how, how the uh, technology evolved. The brass, again, a brass depth adjuster, the iron the wood body and the metal skate and the iron. Again, it's, uh, this is probably, uh, let's say three eighths to half an inch iron. So I, I can pick this up for a larger, wider groove. And this is, uh, again, another development. This is a screw arm type uh, uh, plow plane. So this is adjusted a little differently and the depth adjuster on this is, uh, is wood. So this, uh, it's a matter of releasing this and sliding this up and down and the adjustments are screw arm. So this, it's a little slower than the other one, but it's more accurate. It will maintain its, uh, its uh, adjustment. And this is a, uh, a half inch iron or three eighths. And then I uh, <coughs> restored some, uh, some antique uh, spoke shaves. I enjoyed doing this. I picked these up for almost nothing and uh, restored them and uh, the, the wood's beautiful. And this is a more another advancement in the uh, in the spoke shape. So this has uh, brass adjustment screws for the depth, and uh, the wood's a little different. It's uh, it's oak, white oak, if I'm not mistaken. So this is uh, interesting. I've got a full complement of uh, of antique marking gauges, small levels. These levels, they, it's not that difficult to restore them to this point, and. Uh, you can see the quality of levels, say, over 100, 150 years ago. This is probably late 1800s, early 1900s, where all the components were made to be replaced. So you can see all the screws and uh, vials. Everything was made, was designed to be replaced. So, uh, tools were, uh, craftsmen's tools were more valuable in that era. So they designed them uh, to be repairable and uh, just, they just put more thought and more design and more... Uh, Invested more time in creating more beautiful pieces at the time. Of course, they weren't they weren't created in production environments until the uh, mid uh, early 1900s. So these are uh, hand planes I use most often. At the hand at the, the hand tools categories are measuring and marking. I was just discussing that, and for measuring, I use uh, I use marking gauges. Adjustable marking gauges. I use a uh, I use a ruler with a hook on it, and this I would highly advise getting. If you're going to buy rulers, get the ones with the hook on it. I've probably been using this very same ruler, it's a Veritas ruler, for 25, 30 years. This very same ruler, and I, I love it because I don't have to spend much time orienting it towards an uh, towards an edge and keeping the edge consistent when I'm transferring measurements because the hook. The hook actually performs that. So I'd highly advise. I think Veritas has re, uh, restarted production of this. And I have two or three of these around. And different, they come in different lengths, a 12 inch or an 18 inch. Of course, the chisels, I'll get into. Again, some more measuring marking tools, small levels, the combination square. That's a start, but this is a, this is a, it's a tool everybody should invest in. It's a combination square, so the head is, uh, you can actually actually uh, mark off a 45 or a 90 degree angle, check for level, and uh, use this as a, as, a, as, a, as a marking pin, and uh, adjust it and check for square. So it's quite uh, vers versatile. Again, they call it a combination square because it's, uh, it is due to its versatility. Now, I have both a 12-inch uh, and a 6-inch. This is a... And it's a starret, a six inch one. And I tend to use this as often as a 12 inch one. It's a more recent addition to my hand tools. 
and this is uh, the same principle as the larger one, but but it, uh, it's a little more convenient. I can carry it around, and, and it does everything the larger one does. So I can I can mark off 45 degree angles or 90 degree angles, or remove the head and use this as a ruler. That's another advantage. So I can you can use this as a ruler if you want. Now you don't need necessarily need to buy a starit. Starits are made, still made in the U.S. and they're very, super expensive. But I, uh, for precision, uh, or just give you an idea, when I began my studies in furniture making, <clears throat> some of the instructors would only allow this type of uh, combination square starit due to its uh, precision, high precision and thick metal. That's just now this is a more inexpensive one, but it does the job. I mean, it's, it's, it works well. So I would invest in maybe not a low end, but a, a medium combination square. There's another square I use. It's a T-square, and it's I use considerably, so I can transfer measurements from one side or the other. It's a Veritas Lee Valley, quite well made. It's uh, very positive with uh, thick, uh, thick gauge metal and uh, accurate. So I've had this for a number of years, and I use this a lot. I might have two of these somewhere. These are uh, not very expensive. They're engineer squares. You can pick them up at any woodworking retailer. And what this, uh, what this is exactly what a combination square does, but it's more fixed. So it's fixed at 90 degrees. But they're, they're machinist squares, so they're very, very accurate and much far more accurate than the accuracy we need or precision we need in woodworking, furniture making. This is uh, fantastic. So I've got a number of these in different sizes. I tend to use a large one. I tend to uh, actually align some of my machines with this, like I'll align the table on my bandsaw with using this because of its precision. This is, small. Here, this is probably the smallest version of, uh, of this engineer square. This is uh, maybe a three inch. And that's a six inch. Or, so. so I'll talk today. I'll talk about uh, I'll introduce hand tools. Just like I've been doing, and uh, I'll talk about my workbench and how you need how important it is to have a good workbench. And then tomorrow I'll get into uh, the second part of this uh, these sessions. I'll get into more jigs like a bench hook, uh, a shooting board, uh, a little more talk about hand tools and top, and uh, specialty hand planes. So the, um, I'm not sure if I've, how familiar people are with, uh, with the hand planes in my talk here, but I use uh, a large component of hand planes. So I typically use uh, in my work, my furniture making, I'll use a number four and a half. This is a Lee Nielsen four and a half. I tend to pick this up as my uh, user plane because it's adjusted and I'm, I'm familiar with it. Now, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to invest in hand tools, try not to buy too many hand tools immediately do it over time so you have a better understanding of uh, the, the correct tools you need for the type of work you do and yeah the familiarity also because if you um, if you have uh, fewer hand planes don't look at what I have I've just accumulated these over many many years and I restored several of them and that sort of thing but if you if you're a beginning you can maybe just invest in three or four hand planes it'll be okay the advantage to that is you become very familiar with the few hand planes you have and that's that's important in woodworking because uh just picking up a hand plane that you're not familiar with could slow you down considerably so again this is a four and a half this is my uh my go-to plane for most of my smoothing it's a lee nielsen it's uh maybe 15 or 20 years old it's uh, a cherry uh, cherry handles and tote I can take it apart and show you. This is a lever cap. This is a lever cap. This is the uh, this is the uh, the iron, fairly thick at three sixteenths, if I'm not mistaken. And this is the cap iron. So this is uh, one of the advantages the high end premium uh, hand planes is the is the thickness of the uh, the iron and the, uh, the cap iron. So that reduces chatter and uh, all the side effects of having thinner blades. Another advantage to this particular premium plane is that it's a bedrock style, so I can adjust the frog. The frog holds the, uh, the uh, cap iron and the iron assembly, and I can adjust it without removing all that. Like I removed it now, but I, I, I could easily have adjusted or bring the frog forward or backward just from these three screws in the back here. 
A Bailey style, on the other hand, that I'll show you sh shortly, you need to remove it. You need to take it all apart, and the settings for the, uh, the frog are within the assembly. So that's uh, a little more time consuming. And uh, I'll just put this back together. And this is the adjustment wheel. So this, uh, this wheel, I'm not going to move it too much now, but it, it brings the, uh, the, decreases or increases the depth of the blade. And uh, this is the lateral adjustment lever right here. And this will, and I talk about this quite a bit in my woodworking course in my hand tool class about, uh, and I really get good diagrams on how this works, but this will, this will cock the, uh, the blade over on a left or a right so you can do some skewed work or, or take more off on one side or the other. So that's what I mean by becoming more familiar, having fewer hand tools and becoming really familiar with them. It's probably more to your advantage than just going out and buying a bunch of, uh, you know, the marketing people will tell you to purchase as many hand tools as you can of all sizes and orientations and styles, but that's really not, really, really not as important as. So again, the frog adjustment will advance the, uh, will advance the blade towards the, uh, the front, this is some wax I apply for gliding. And uh, so it advances the, uh, the iron towards the front of the mouth for, for tighter, smaller shavings or retracts it for rougher, coarser work. So that's how easy it is to adjust that here. And the depth, of course, is done with the adjusting wheel. That's as simple as a uh, tool as possible for, uh, for, doing, for, for doing considerable amount of woodworking. So I use, uh, I use a four and a half for my, uh, for my smoothing and, uh, and work, not preliminary processing reports. And then I'll show you a, uh, a number three I tend to pick up. This is a number three, but it's a Bailey style. So if you're adjusting the frog, I'll just take this apart. See, notice it's smaller than what I just showed you is a four and a half, which is a essentially a wide number four. Number three is uh, it's a beautiful plane. It's just this, this is as small as I go because you can't really get a good grip on the number two or number one. The, whole, the way to hold it is to have your fingers around the handle and then keep one finger outside and then control it with the knob here in the front for pressure. Not too much pressure, but this is a Bailey style and the adjustment is, in a, is not in the back. It's, uh, and then uh, again, it's got the same, it's constructed the same way with a lever cap with the uh, iron and cap iron. Now this particular uh, record number three has been updated, upgraded with a, uh, a thicker uh, hawk iron. You can buy these uh, through Verita, through Lee Valley. They're replacement uh, irons. It comes at assembly with, as an assembly with the cap iron and they're specific for different models of uh, early uh, Stanley and record planes. So again, it works the same way. The adjustment wheel will, will advance or retract the uh, blade and the lateral adjustment talks it to one side or the other. And again, look at the frog here. The frog adjustment screws are within the frog, so you really need to remove, disassemble it to be able to advance and retract the frog. Now, having said that, I rarely ever move the frog because once it's set, you tend to dial my hand planes into very tight shavings. And I, all I need to do is really advance or retract the, uh, the blade for thicker or thinner shavings. So I don't really play with the frog much, but having the bedrock style, the Lee Nielsen bedrock style and the Veritas also has, uh, has that style, is uh, it's an advantage over uh, Bailey style for that reason. And this, uh, again, if you, if you look at the, uh, the iron, it moves from left to right through my lateral adjustment. So you can do some fine fine adjustments doing it that way and eyeball in the, the clearance so it's uniform. Uh, eyeball the clearance and so it's uniform across the mouth through the lateral adjustment lever and the depth. So normally what I do is I retract the, retract the iron completely and begin hand planing and then slowly advance it to where it's taking shavings off so it doesn't bite into the wood too much at the beginning and I'll just show I'll give an example of that. The example board I'm going to use is this board. So it's important, uh, grain orientation is important. 
when you're hand planing, so I always look uh, at the side of the, the board and I look for a rising grain. Well, this is uh, this is white oak, and uh, okay, I think that's correct. And I'd like to talk about the uh, the work holding system I've developed here. I use a face vise in conjunction with uh, with this accessory that slides along the face vise and locks in. And it's got a leather face, and I lock it into another. Uh, similar type thing that this one plugs in. It plugs in through a dog hole and then locks it to the side so it doesn't pivot. Now you don't necessarily have to use this. You can use a, uh, a wooden bench, a wood bench dog. Do it that way or maybe here. Depends on the length of the board. So you could use a bench dog, so let's just use a bench dog. So I'll try this. I haven't used this plane in a while, so I'll try some. Um, by the way, I'm uh, I'm left-handed, so. <laughs> I have different setups for for tailvice. I have a tail tailvice on this end. So if you're right-handed on this particular bench, which is built, it's symmetric on either side. You could use these. Uh, these attachments I've developed, or you can use this attachment. Uh, because I'm left-handed, I tend to use want to use this. But that, that's very fine. So I'll just advance it a little. These are very fine shavings. So. More substantial. I just advance the, uh, I advance the, uh, the iron a little. This is how I would. Uh, finish the uh, surface of a piece of wood, or this could be a rail of a front rail of a of a cabinet stand. Another thing I tend to do is, uh, as I apply some uh, some wax to the uh, to the sole of the hand plane, I could use a paraffin wax, a stick of paraffin wax, and this lasts forever. I've got three or four of these on the go in my work benches, and I just wipe them across. But lately, I've been begun to use this Veritas tool wax, so I. Uh, They're both similar, but this is a little more fine. So I just apply this to, to the sole. And that not only protects the sole, but it uh, it allows it to glide much smoother for a longer period of time. Uh, one of these tins will last, I'd say, a number of years. So it's uh, so I keep it handy on my workbench. And I'll just show you. This is probably going to go flying now. So it really, really helps with uh, removing resistance, that, that tool wax. And that's, uh, that's that point. I'll, just, I'll give you an example of uh, doing the edge of the board also. So if I were jointing the edge, I'd lock it in the same way, similarly. This is probably yeah, that's a very fun setting. So when you uh, when you use hand planes, you'll find that through the uh, just using it, you can advance or retract the. Uh, the adjustment wheel while you're hand playing there's between strokes so that's what i've been doing here i'm actually these are super fine shavings
And that's, I, get, I guess you get the idea of uh, work holding. Another tip I can provide is, uh, is the use of uh, block planes. Now, most block planes are, uh, the most, most people purchase a low angle block plane because they've been, they've been, uh, there's quite a bit of marketing revolving around the low angle aspect of it for rendering. And this is a typical low angle uh, Ignilson Vertas makes similar, similar quality premium hand, uh, block plane. But this is a 60 and a half and it's low angle. So it's the bed is at 12 degrees and the, the combination of uh, bevel on a bevel up 25 and 12 is 37 degrees as opposed to 45 degrees for standard angle so this this creates a uh, it works better in conjunction with uh, with uh, end grains and the reason i mentioned that is i tend to use that a lot but i also use a standard angle this is a similar block plane but it's uh it's a nine and a half and it's uh it's set to 45 degrees so i tend to use this as a small smoother and i'll give a demonstration of that if you're, uh, if you're working with uh, very small components, I'll put this aside here. If you're working with very small components and you need to joint the edge, you can, you can understand that a, uh, a large plane, uh, even a three or a four, is fairly large and it's it's cumbersome to use on a small piece, so I tend to pick up a uh, nine and a half plane, and this is how I do it. This will take, and I always try to get a complete shaving from one end to the other. You can see how beautifully this works, and these are just complete shavings. So you can see how the advantage of uh, of this type of plane. Now, most woodworkers are not familiar with these, but and I'm not even sure that Lee Nielsen still manufactures it, but it's, uh, it's a nine and a half and it's a standard angle. And this was used, again, before the whole concept of low angle was introduced. Uh, this was uh, with a small, smoother, a small block plane. So you tend to use that a lot. We'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about preparing wood. Again, I tend to use machines more often than not, but a, uh, I have a piece of wood here. I just want to give you an idea of what it's like to prepare a piece of wood, a rough, a rough plank. Um, just move that over, put some of this away. A rough plank. I happen to have a rough plank here, some sort of mahogany. Not quite sure, right? And uh, what I'll do is, uh, so I, again, I, I look at the, the grain, and in this case, it's, uh, it's rising in this direction. So I, I will hang a plane in this direction, but I'm just preparing the wood now, and I've started to prepare it already. You can see the difference from uh, what it looked like originally to, to now. And so this guy. So this is a work holding system I use with this in conjunction with this. It's a little beefier than just using a, a bench top and it plugs in. So I have two similar workbenches and it's plug compatible with both. So again, this, this part keeps it from pivoting and the bench dog locks it in. So again, it's customized to uh, to your workbench. And uh, in this case, uh, the important part is the offset from the edge of the workbench. And uh, very easy to make, by the way. It's just, uh, I make so many of these. I have, there's another one there, tons of these. And I have also this version, it's an earlier version. So this actually, the issue with this is that it did rotate. So I would uh, plug it in and uh, you can offset it but it did rotate, so I tend not to use that one as much now. I use this, this system.
The other advantage of this type of work holding is I can actually raise it. I don't have to have it. If, if the board is pretty uh, thick, as in this case, I can actually raise this. It's locked in. Now, the demonstration I'm going to give is how to prepare a uh, rough plank using a totally different type of uh, plane. It's called a scrub plane. It's a specialty plane, but it's it's designed uh, with a very large mouth and a highly cambered blade. So it's quite a bit of a curve on that. And the reason for the highly high camber is to remove material only in the middle. So it's just, uh, it's called hogging out material, hogging material from a board. And because of its, its camber, it really only works in this limited area that protrudes from the, uh, from the mouth. So it's a specialty plane. It's really, really only designed to prepare a board and remove the, uh, the surface of it, the rough surface. And so you can, we can use a jointer after to dress it. So I'll just give you an idea. This is, I could increase the depth, but I'll just give you. Just increase the depth a little bit. So because, because I'm working Diagonally, this. This, this cleans up the board. cleans up the surface and it makes a huge mess too but this is this is how it used to be done before before thickness planers and jointers so you can see the what it looks like now and what it looked like originally or even at the far end so this actually cleans it up and then we can take a uh, we can take a, a jointer plane I normally don't have this much this much uh, tools on the workbench. And that's why I have to keep putting things away okay, for this demonstration. But the next phase of this is to use a long a long sole plane, number six and above, to write out the uh, the ebbs and the flows, the high points of the board. So I run that across. So I do have a uh, a metal version, a number seven, and you notice a progression of number four, five, six, seven. A seven is almost as long as a jointer gets, although there is a number eight, but the disadvantage of a number eight, which I don't even own and purposely don't own, is because it's, it's very extremely heavy. So you could go and use a, a wood body plane. Now this is, a, this is a series of planes I developed. Again, I was, uh, keen on making my own tools and marketing them over a period of years. This is, believe it or not, these tools are, I was marketing them 22 years ago, and uh, these are leftovers. I've kept them because of their unique styles. I've kept a few in my workshop at another area of the workshop, another cabinet. And this is uh, the jointer I developed with a hawk iron. So I learned how to make these uh, 22 years ago, 2002. The 2003, I was actually make, doing this and marketing them. I remember, remember at the time the uh, the whole hand tool movement was just starting, just beginning, and people were were uh, were keen on acquiring wood body hand tools. I'm not sure if this is set correctly, but. This is what a jointer does. 
I'm not quite as long as a number seven, but it prepares the wood. Nice thing about the wood body ones is they automatically blight. You don't even need to apply any lubrication or any wax, but I do it anyway. And this, uh, the issue with this particular board is there's a huge knot in the middle. So it's got a little squirrely grain going on right here. And that's the direction of the grain actually reverses between here and here. So it's kind of rough, but you can see how smooth it is everywhere else. So what I'll do is I'll apply some So I apply some, some tool wax again with the salt. Let me see how that makes it. Really enjoyable to use these planes. You can see the, uh, the ridges leaving the or slowly disappearing. So this is how it was done. There still is if you don't uh, want to invest in machines. Preparing, uh, preparing boards for furniture making. So it's quite uh, labor intensive. <laughs> you can see why, why people sort of uh, migrate towards machines, towards uh, per preliminary processing. So once I've done that, I uh, get a straight edge. This is a small version of the straight edge, but I have longer ones, and I usually test this, uh, have a look at the, uh, from side to side to see if, I'm, if I have any uh, high points. And if you're uh, working with a board this size, you probably need a much longer straight edge, and I have some. But the idea is just to go along and measure, see if all the high points are disappearing. So it's quite labor intensive to do this because you're not only making the surfaces smooth, but you're bringing it down to thickness. And if you're not using uh, a machine, you can imagine starting with a board like this. And if you need uh, two inches and it's two and a quarter inches, the amount of, the amount of hand planing you need to perform. So again, it's a machine, a thickness planer will shine at this as long as you don't destroy too much of the board. So I tend to use my, uh, my hand planes mostly for in the latter stages, and I do, I'll do some of this if it's in an exceptionally exotic wood or something, but uh, I'm more often than not, I'll pick a machine. Another thing is actually for the flatness, this particular board. There's a little bit of rock in there, so I need to find out where the high point is and eliminate that. Same thing here, it looks like the rock's on from left to right, so I need to, there's probably a high point right here. So what I would do is get that scrub plane out or remove or hog some wood out from, uh, from the center section here until I, and then I keep, keep measuring it with the uh, a long straight edge until the uh, straight edge is uniform. The gap between the board and the straight edge is uniform from one end to the other and across. I can use a shorter one for that. And then you know you'll have a good uh, reference surface. And once you have a good reference surface on one side, you can begin, begin to thickness it down. And then again, go through that process. And uh, again, it's quite labor intensive. So you're, if you're creating small, small work, you can get away with it. But if you're creating large furniture, it just, you know, it depends on how much time and how much you enjoy doing that. But once you've done it a few times and you master it, you tend to, uh, it's just labor intensive work. Good exercise though. So, <laughs> well, tomorrow I'll talk about uh, chisels, saws, and I'll talk. I did talk about the work holding and the type of different type of workbenches and uh, face vise that I've been using today, and an end vise on this particular workbench. I use my face vise as a tail vise, and uh, 
So you don't, you know, using this system, you don't necessarily have to have a, uh, a tail voice. But then again, it depends on your or your your hand orientation. I'm left-handed, so this works for me. Tomorrow we'll talk about. I have some specialty planes. This is a router plane with a fence on it, so I use this to hog out material and uh, from give you an idea if I'm doing some uh, some uh, inserts for uh, for hinges. I'm letting in a hinge into a, the end of a board, the edge of a board. I would use this to hog out the material with a smaller blade. <coughs> These are some uh, early marking gauges. So you can see the progression and the design over the years. This is what they used to look like and this is what it looks like today. So I'll show you some chisel racks and uh, talk about the different types of chisels and some uh, modern, more modern. Uh, I'll show you the antique, the vintage uh, plow planes and I'll show you a more modern version of a plow plane. This is a very, very happy with uh, with this particular plane. It's a, it's a modern, uh, it's a Veritas, uh, very light, very well-built uh, plow plane. And I use this, uh, again, for drawer grooves. It has a quarter-inch blade or 3 16 blade, and it's offset. So I tend to keep it set to whatever I use for uh, offsetting my drawer grooves and the drawer sides. So it works really well. It's very light. And you could do this, you can accomplish this with another plane that's available. It's also, it's a combination plane. I don't own one, own one, a Veritas combination plane, but it does the same thing. It's just that it's a little more versatile. You can do more with it, but this is strictly a, uh, a plow plane, a uh, grooving plane, I should say. And uh, here's a depth adjustment and then ops, adjust the arms. And so the fence is offset. Now the wood, the wood fence doesn't come with it. You need to add that on, but it's, Pretty straightforward. But this is a beautiful plane, and uh, here's an example of uh, one of my chisel racks. This is for fine chisels. It's a set of Young Chan chisels. Again, they used to be available locally through uh, Veritas, but they're no longer available in the freight, and they're for fine work. They're strictly paring chisels. So when it comes to chisels, uh, it's a type of chisel you want to hit with a hem with a small mallet. Uh, or a paring chisel and use strictly your hand, your palm to drive the chisel in. So these are different sizes and you can see how fine they are. But this, uh, I use this uh, considerably for dovetail work, to clean up some dovetails and for fine inlay work. So I've designed this, uh, this little stand for that and I keep it at, what I like about these, uh, the stand, this particular stand and my others, chisel stand is that I could keep it, uh, it's portable. So I can move it between my workbenches. I have exactly the same workbench at the other end. The thing is I used to teach here one-on-one uh, -on -one, and I don't do that much anymore. So uh, it's more of a workshop for two to three people to work in. This is uh, another example of a, of a chisel stand that is port again portable. And I've got an all here at one end. And this is uh, an addition later on, but I've got the full complement, and I can see the the the, the 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 width of the chisel from the bottom, so I can pick one, and they're all in their specific slots. So I tend to uh, keep this in the tool well of my uh, workbench and move it between workbenches. So again, I'll talk about this tomorrow a little more and uh, introduce some of the. Uh, the jigs I use for my uh, my uh, my workbench accessories uh, in the form of a dovetail jig, uh, the shooting board I use considerably. I have about four shooting boards now, and the bench hooks. One of the bench hooks I'll uh, I'll talk about tomorrow is uh, it's one that I developed for a magazine article. Part of the article uh, involved creating a small project, so I do market that uh, that bench hook plan. It's part of uh, my woodworking course at the moment at woodskills.com, but it's quite versatile, and I'll show you why. It's uh, it's not a conventional bench hook with a small addition. It makes it much more versatile between workbenches. And then um, the shooting board. Now, the shooting board, again, was developed for, uh, for I'll talk about tomorrow, it was developed for a fine woodworking article uh, a few years ago. I created uh, several bench jigs and for that article, and one of them uh, from was actually 
we built two of them here during the, uh, the, the filming and photo photographing and writing of the article. And I, I tend to use this. They're, they're, they're upgraded now for a different type of hand plane. But I'll show you the earlier one and, uh, and now I transition to the newer one with a dedicated shooting plane. And that makes a world of difference. Before that, I was using a low angle track or a number six uh, work plane for, uh, for shooting, which they work, they work just as well. The only issue is uh, the newer version has a track and I don't have to concentrate on moving uh, on this plane shifting. I just work towards front to back motion. And uh, so it keeps it locked in. I don't have to worry about both front to back and side to side movement as much. So we'll talk about that tomorrow and uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this and it's, uh, it's inspired you to work with hand tools and uh, we'll talk tomorrow about, uh, so we talked about dressing, thicknessing, jointing, smoothing, and I'll uh, talk about some end grain work tomorrow. And it's, uh, I think we've got past the time, so I'll take this up tomorrow. I don't see any questions, so I'll just, uh, we'll terminate the session right now. And uh, if you do have any questions, come back tomorrow. And uh, if you think about anything you might want to add, ask. And uh, specifically about what I've described today, the, uh, the workbench, anything about my tools. And uh, I love answering questions because then I don't have to put as much thought into what I need to say. So the questions resolves that problem, that issue. And I'll talk about saws too. And I'll talk when I talk about the bench work. I'll talk about the fine saws I tend to use for dovetail work, panel saws, and uh, 